It's good to worship with you this morning. Thank you for inviting me to come. I'm Chris Armstrong. I'm the founding director of Opus, the Art of Work here at the college, as uh, Chappie Mack mentioned, and a faculty member in the Bible and Theology Department. And this morning, I'd like you to reflect with me for a few minutes on work. What we'll explore this morning applies to any kind of work and any kind of workplace, even the grind of graduate studies. So I was sitting in my cubicle today, and I realized ever since I started working, um, every single day of my life has been worse than the day before it. So that means that every single day that you see me, that's on the worst day of my life. What about today? Is today the worst day of your life? Yeah. Wow, that's messed up. I'm sorry. Is there any way that you could sort of just zonk me out so that, like, I, I don't know that I'm at work in here? Could I come home and think that I've been fishing all day or something? That's really not what I do, Peter. <laughs> I hope none of you have experienced work the way that Peter does here in the movie office space, but um, I think we've all experienced some of the thorns and thistles of work described in the passage that we were uh, leading up to there, here in Genesis 3. This passage lays out for us a turning point in the history of work. The most basic way we see work going wrong after the fall is that it's become toilsome and difficult, both in terms of sh sheer labor and all kinds of problems and difficulties. Since the fall, we've wrung productivity from the earth and from the world's natural elements only through a lot of sweat and unpleasant labor. In the farming economy of the Old Testament, thorns and thistles meant something worse than just hard labor or inconvenience. It meant that trying to grow the food that you need in order to survive, you might get nothing but weeds. That's pretty messed up. We might call this the frustration factor, referring to the many things that go wrong in our work, hampering the production of good fruit of whatever kind. But the problem with our work after the fall goes beyond that, doesn't it? Beyond laboriousness and frustrated production. There seems to be a deeper and relational dimension to the brokenness of work. When Adam and Eve disobey, eating the fruit that God has forbidden them to eat, what happens next? God is in the garden, calling to them in the cool of the day. And what are they doing? They're, they're hiding. They're hiding from him. They're refusing to answer that call. By choosing to disobey God and eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve have broken their relationship with God. They no longer answer his call to come to him. They hide themselves from his presence. But they've also broken their relationship with each other. Though they're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, they're now ashamed and hiding their nakedness from each other. So what we see in our work is pretty much what we'd expect to see in this fallen world. One aspect of our work in this world um, is ev inevitably going to be difficult and broken relationships. But let's peel the onion one layer deeper. I've used the word frustration to talk about the ways that we're thwarted sometimes from our purpose since the fall. But it's one thing sometimes to not get the results we want at work, and another to be so deeply thwarted or so lacking for whatever reason in any sense that our work is good and productive, that we just can't see any purpose in our work at all. We call this maybe a step beyond frustration to futility. Sadly, I think this is true for many, many people in their work, whether because they're sealed away in a cubicle like the poor characters in office space or working as a small cog in a large machine or, or creating something that just doesn't seem to improve the world in any real noticeable way, the result is the same. I remember a period in my doctoral dissertation process when the whole thing just seemed one long, pointless exercise in futility. I reached the point where literally the only way I could feel useful to the world was to go to a Red Cross office and give blood. I kid you not. And maybe you've tasted a little of that in your own work. However it happens, people can come to experience such a disconnect between their work and the supposed good results it should achieve that frustration deepens into futility and that loss of meaning and purpose. Either explicitly or subconsciously, they may come to the conclusion of the writer of Ecclesiastes that their work is vanity and striving after wind. And again, I think 
most of us has experienced some sense, some of that sense of futility at some point in our work. For some of us, it may be a daily reality, actually, right now. And for too many, it results in a complete lack of engagement. In if work. you would, would you walk us through a typical day for you? Yeah. Great. Well, I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door. That way, Lumberg can't see me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I just sort of space out for about an hour. Tell him but, Space out? Yeah, I just stare at my desk, but it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. Why do we work so hard? A recent survey conducted by the Gallup organization entitled The State of the American Workplace highlights this syndrome. They asked people whether they were fully engaged, partially engaged, or disengaged at work. And the stats are not good. What they found was that 70% of Americans are disengaged or at least not actively engaged in their workplaces. Somewhere along the way, their work had become decoupled from any sense of meaning or purpose. And at the extreme end, a significant number of American workers had reached such a complete state of disgruntlement that they had started, in fact, to work actively against their employers. And if you watch this movie, you've seen an instance of that. So in our work, we can experience a frustration of our productivity. We can experience a sense of futility, meaninglessness in our labor. But I think there's a third and even deeper layer of the onion. Work has gone awry for so many of us, not just because our efforts can be frustrated or because we've ha found it hard to see the connection between what we're doing and any good in the world. But um, beneath those symptoms is a final cause. We've lost the fundamental meaning of our work. Now, what is that meaning? It's God's creative purpose in making us working beings in the first place, beings whose nature it is to work. For, for us, it's sometimes difficult not to be working, and certainly difficult when we're in those frustrating situations where it seems to be meaningless or the, the products are not coming. That tells us something about our created nature. We are to work for our own good, for the good of others, and for God's greater glory. That's, that's how we were created. Before I tease that out a little further, think about what motivates the world to work in the absence of any understanding of that God-givenness. Why do we work so hard? For what? For this? For stuff? Other countries, they work, they stroll home, they stop by the cafe, they take August off. Off. Why aren't you like that? Why aren't we like that? Because we're crazy, driven, hard-working believers, that's why. Those other countries think we're nuts. Whatever. Were the Wright brothers insane? Bill Gates, Les Paul, Ali. Were we nuts when we pointed to the moon? That's right. We went up there, and you know what we got? Bored. So we left. Got a car up there, left the keys in it. Do you know why? Because we're the only ones going back up there, that's why. But I digress. It's pretty simple. You work hard, you create your own luck, and you gotta believe anything is possible. As for all the stuff, that's the upside of only taking two weeks off in August. Nespa? Anyone seen that before? So maybe that ad is a caricature, but I think it communicates some uncomfortable truths. Can you hear the reasons why this guy is going to work in the morning? Materialism, a sort of maverick self-sufficiency, we're making our own luck, the need to compare our American work with the inferior work of other countries, even the complete subsuming of personal identity into work so that we become obsessive true believers in that work. That's what work looks like without God in the picture. So what does it look like when we return to our creator? In creating us and placing us in a garden to work and till it and to be in charge of all resources, animal, vegetable, mineral, God was clearly calling us to work. Some Christian thinkers have named this the creation mandate or the cultural mandate. It's our first great commission, active long before that other commission of Matthew 28. Genesis even suggests that through that commission, God was making us co-creators with him. He made the garden, we cultivate it. He made the wheat, we make the bread. He made the minerals, and with all their Latin potential, and in the millennia since that creation, we have gone on co-creating, drawing that potential out, 
making tools, bridges, fillings for our teeth, rocket ships, semiconductors. If we can come to see our work as co-creation, then we must also see it as inherently relational. First, it's a relationship with God, who is above us and to whom we answer as stewards. Second, it's a relationship with the world, which is below us and over which we have dominion. And third, it's a relationship with others who are beside us and whom we serve as people equal in dignity before God. And the problem is, as we've been teasing out this morning, the fall disrupts all three of those relationships. It disrupts our relationship with the earth, frustrating our productivity, disrupts our relationship with our fellow humans, and we often find it hard to see how our work really is helping others, and it disrupts our relationship with God as we no longer work as unto the Lord, but hide from him in our work, just as Adam and Eve hid from God. Those disruptions mess with our work. They mess with the meaning of our work, and they mess with our identity as workers in God. We no longer have a sense, first, that our power and authority are delegated from above. So we become obsessed with what we can accomplish in our work, maybe full of swagger and braggadocio, like the guy in the Cadillac ad, at the, as if all the power that we exercise comes from ourselves. Second, we start mistreating the others whom we're supposed to be serving in our work customers, colleagues, community members, and so forth. Rather than serving others, we look to dominate, to take what we can get, to extract value from the world instead of adding it. And third, we no longer take our work seriously as a responsibility of stewardship to our maker. And so we can come to feel that we may exploit his creation to our own selfish ends, however we want. In other words, throughout our work, and throughout our work lives, our fallenness left unchecked can drag us down into narcissism, into domination, into exploitation. But how God's redemptive grace can change all that, I'll suggest in a moment. But first, I want to just put a one-word name on what we've considered so far. This is a good Christian wor word for work as it's meant to be. And it's a word for what we've lost when we've lost a God perspective in our work. And it's the word vocation. This is the term Christians have used for centuries to talk about how our work has meaning and gives purpose. Think of a similar word like vocalize. Vocation's Latin work means to call. We're called to our work. By whom? Of course, by God. And we have to be careful here. I think it's easy to misunderstand the concept of vocation as if it meant that all of us will hear a loud voice calling from God saying, be a nurse or be an accountant or what have you, or be a biblical studies professor. When we turn to scripture, though, we find that the cases of such specific calling to particular jobs are actually quite rare. Don't be fooled, though. God does guide us to good works which he has prepared in advance, as Ephesians 2.10 says. There are just usually no burning bushes or audible words involved. Far more usually, he guides us through an awareness of the particular gifts, skills, talents, and abilities that he's given us, both internally and more often as we listen to how other people see us, people like teachers, friends, family, or co-workers. Or he helps us to recognize and be sensitive to the needs of the world and start to grow a clear sense of calling out of that. Or he can speak vocation to us through the deepest desires of our hearts, whether that be for work done in a paying job or work on behalf of others in non-paying relationships of service. If God is speaking to us in those ways, then why do we find it so hard to hear him clearly? There are a lot of reasons, but the core of the matter is right there in Genesis. In the cool of the day, God is calling us as he did Adam and Eve in the garden. We've just developed all sorts of ways of hiding, maybe even unintentionally, of avoiding those callings. Our fallenness breaks vocation, and sometimes it's really hard to get that sense of vocation back. What happens when we lack that sense of vocation in our lives? Sometimes we try to find meaning in the sheer earning of a paycheck, or we try to fill the need for a coherent life purpose by focusing obsessively with career advancement or the size of our compensation packages. Or maybe worst of all, uh, in our primary work, we may begin to work harder and harder, longer and longer, seeking meaning exclusively in that work loading too much of our identity into that until our whole identity becomes swallowed by a job. I'd like to tell you that this syndrome of vocation lost is limited to non-Christians or that it gets better when you rise in your field. That's not what the data shows. Michael Lindsay, the author of Christians in the Halls of Power, interviewed 
evangelical Christians who had reached the top of their fields in business, academics, and so forth, and entertainment, etc. Here's what he said. The leaders I interviewed fall into the same pits as their secular peers. They're susceptible to materialism and overweening pride. Many Christians in the upper ranks in Hollywood, for example, Lindsay discovered, quote, differ little from others in the entertainment industry. They drive luxury cars, live in exclusive communities, and worry that their fame and talent will evaporate overnight. Lindsay did find shining exceptions. But as Amy Sherman points out in her book, Kingdom Calling, according to the data of Lindsay's study, the vast majority of evangelicals perched atop their career ladders in various social sectors displayed a profoundly anemic vision for what they could accomplish for the kingdom of God. This, Sherman concludes, is a failure of vocation. It indicates that these Christian leaders' understanding of their work has become divorced from their faith. They're not hearing the calling of God, or if they are, in some level, they may be hiding from it, to some degree, like Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, we have to be careful here not to overgeneralize. Sherman is not saying that all leading business entrepreneurs or executives or entertainment figures um, are, are doing what they do, for example, just for money or fame. Um, Christian or non-Christian, such leaders often start their climb to prominence in their fields because they want to contribute to the world, or they have a true and objective love for the craft of what they do. And these are actually quite healthy motivations for work. The problem is that if decoupled from our true vocation in God, these mo motivations are just not enough. If in your work you don't look for meaning and satisfaction in God, then almost inevitably you're going to start looking where everyone else does, in material goods, a rising reputation, all the ego-stroking rewards of success. In other words, if your vision of vocation or work is separated from God, it's a broken one in need of redemption. What would it be like for us right now to rediscover vocation in our daily work? What would we find that our work is for in this world? The reformer Martin Luther taught that God gave us work as his primary way of meeting the everyday needs of all people. Through the human pursuit of vocations, Luther said, the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, the sick are healed, the ignorant are enlightened, and the weak are protected. That is, by working, we actually participate in God's ongoing providence for the human race. In his commentary on Genesis, Luther claims that God even milks the cows through those called to that work. Or to think of it from the consumer standpoint, even as we're praying in the words that Jesus has taught us, asking for our daily bread, people are already busy at work in the bakeries to answer those prayers. Finally, not only are we participating in God's providence when we work, adding value to the world for human flourishing. We're also directly obeying both parts of Jesus' twofold law of love, to love God and to love our neighbor. In Matthew 25, Jesus says that when you serve the least of these, his people on earth who are in any kind of need, you are serving the Lord himself. Think of the power of this. Though it may take some effort and some prayer, when we can see our present work, even the Greek courses or the seemingly interminable theses that are preparing us for future service, in the light of this vocation and this service, then we can realize, even in the grind, that we are fulfilling the law of love. I have to be careful here. Yes, some of us seem to get more than our fair share of the thorns and thistles. For us, perhaps for a season or even for much of our working lives, it just seems really, really hard to see in our work any of this vocation through which we can live and love God and others. In those times, we may need to look for vocation not in our primary work, say, for now as a student or in paid work, but rather in other non-workday relationships. And that's okay. Luther insisted, and I think this is true, that at any given time we have not one, but many overlapping vocations as employee, sister, mother, citizen, neighbor, and on and on. But even, or maybe especially, when it becomes tough to see God's purposes in our primary work, I'd encourage you to practice the spiritual discipline of discernment. As you leave today, ask God to help you discern his calling in the midst of the thorns and the thistles of your work. Ask him to cast the light of vocation on even your most difficult and alienated work. For work, fallen though it is, was his plan and his purpose for us from the beginning.